Good evening, and welcome to the Museum of Science. Uh, I'm James Wetzel, the co-producer of adult programs here at the museum, and I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's program. Tonight, we are honored to present the Lee and Niall Albright Annual Symposium. The Albrights established this series to put a spotlight on exciting new research concerning human health. And this evening, we are happy to be hosting this symposium for the fourth year. So thank you, Lee and Niall, for your continued generous support. And we are lucky enough because Dr. Albright would like to say a few words. So Dr. Albright, if you would come up, please. Welcome. This is indeed a very exciting time for the Albright family. We're very connected going back to Brad Washburn with the Museum of Science. After I had spent a summer on the slopes of Mount McKinley mapping Mount McKinley, Alaska, I got to know him well, and that began, began my association with the Museum of Science those many years ago in the mid-1950s. Thank you for all being here. You're in for a great evening with five outstanding people from the Department of Sciences at Boston University. We're off to a great start. This is our fourth year, as James mentioned. Our first three symposiums were absolutely distinguished. Tim Spector from London opened our first seminar explaining how we can change our genes, which was a whole new idea to me, through epigenetics. And he came and spoke again another year. And then we had the privilege of Robert Stuckgold, who told us about what I love for title, The Good Life. And it was fun because his very last slide, where he went through all the human emotions, he mentioned a graph of when we are happy in married life, when there are ups and lows, and at the very end of it, by far the highest peak was when the children left home. <laughs> so it got everybody's attention. And then we've had a wonderful uh, presentation uh, by, about the bio, human biome. And Dr. Hayes, in the two years since, has worked to establish a whole department on the biome uh, at both MIT and Harvard Medical School. So welcome, we're just so delighted to have you here. We're in for a good evening, and you're gonna be exposed to five exceptional people from Boston University. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albright. The research leading the way towards precision medicine and precision health will open new vistas for enabling humans to live their healthiest life. We are thrilled to showcase the work coming out of Boston University tonight. First, we will be greeted by Gloria Waters, BU's Vice President and Associate Provost for Research. Next, Katya Ravid, the Founding Director of the Evans Center for Interdisciplinary Research at BU, will introduce us to the teamwork propelling the research forward. Then two researchers, Lindsay Ferrer and Rhoda O, oh, will talk about their recent findings. And afterwards, Lindsay and Rhoda will have a conversation with Alice Cornyn Golam. To conclude the evening, we will, of course, have time for questions from you, the audience, as well. So as you can tell, it's a packed program. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Gloria Waters, followed by Katya Ravid. Thank you very much. So on behalf of BU, I want to say that we're just absolutely honored to be here this evening for this very important event. Uh, many of the great challenges that we face today, especially in human health and in medicine, really require that disciplines work together and that uh, researchers and scientists from many, many different areas uh, collaborate. BU has a really strong record of innovative faculty who work together uh, to solve problems and create new knowledge. And it's an area that we're really investing in, and I think tonight you're going to hear about uh, some of the ways that that investment is paying off. Two examples in particular, I think, of our investment are, one, our new Kilichon Center for Integrated Life Sciences and Engineering, which is a new uh, building uh, on Commonwealth Avenue, which you might see as you go by, where we're really encouraging uh, engineers, bioengineers, data scientists, uh, physicians, life scientists of all sorts to work together to really solve many of the huge challenges that we face today in areas from human health to material science and even climate change. 
And another example of the way that we're bringing faculty together in innovative ways uh, is through the Evans Center, which was created in 2009. And it is a way of bringing together faculty to do interdisciplinary uh, biomedical research. It was established first in the School of Medicine, but recently has been expanded all across the campus and involves faculty from biology, chemistry, and uh, data science in many, many different fields, which Katja will tell you about. So I think there's no uh, better example of uh, work that we're doing that's collaborative in this kind of way than the work that you're going to hear about tonight. Uh, it's really an example of the way that team science can work well together and really yield an impact that will affect many millions of people and their lives. So Katja. Good evening, and again, thank you and welcome everyone. Precision science, precision health, just the word precision imply how complex this area of research can be. And so it does require a, an array of expertise, an array of investigators coming from different disciplines, and to really uh, be able to progress in this field, we need what we call team science, integrative team science, integrative facilities such as the one that Gloria mentioned, and facilitators. Boston University have spearheaded, uh, as, as, long, as, as well as the medical school, have spearheaded uh, what we call progression in team science several years ago through the establishment of mechanism by which investigators can engage in interdisciplinary team science. And one of the mechanisms involved establishment and development of groups that uh, we call affinity research collaboratives, or ARCs, and we chose this acronym to symbolize our mission of arting between different disciplines. So such groups or such ARCs consist of investigators uh, from different disciplines being genetics, mathematics, say, uh, biochemistry, clinicians, coming together bound by a common interest to solve an important biomedical uh, problem. And we have several such arcs, such as in cardiovascular disease, in regenerative medicine, in neurodegenerative disease, and so on. And to highlight the importance of such arcs in solving such complex problems in the context of precision health or precision medicine is a very recent example of an arc focused on thrombosis and cardiovascular disease, where investigators from bioengineering, biochemistry, genetics, and so on, identified components in the blood of patients with chronic kidney disease which make those patients more susceptible to cardiovascular disease as compared to other patients who have the same malady, the same kidney disease, but do not develop such uh, a risk for cardiovascular disease. So this is an example of a research that touches upon precision medicine, identifying patients with certain biomarkers. And this is facilitated, as I said, by our ability to bring together investigators from different disciplines. Similarly today, you will hear how this field is applicable and is a pursued at Boston University in the area of a neurobiology and neurodegenerative disease. And I will invite Dr. Lindsay Ferrer to start this presentation. Uh, for myself and my colleagues to talk about some of our work, and uh, hopefully you'll come away with a better appreciation. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about a couple of initiatives in precision medicine. But before I focus on that, I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page. Precision medicine is not a new term. It's not a new thought. In fact, uh, former President Obama uh, recognized the importance and pressed Congress to allocate funds for this. And as a result, there have been many initiatives, including the initiative in precision medicine. So uh, first, we should just make sure we're on the same page and talk about, well, what is precision medicine? Well, it's basically recognizing that people are very different from one another. And if we study a large group of people, we want to identify 
a variable number of features that can identify them to guide us in diagnosis, treatment, and ultimately prevention of disease. And um, the knowledge of one's profile can help deciding which medicines are given and, and administer it, as you'll see in an example, the proper dose or regimen. And as I alluded to, this area is being advanced through the Human Genome Project, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and more recently by the NIH uh, Precision Medicine Initiative that resulted from the allocation to the budget by President Obama. So a lot of people come and ask me, well, isn't, I hear, I hear a lot of it, but it sounds like a lot of hype. Well, it depends on what you think about that's being hyped. But in reality, precision medicine is here and operating now. So for example, oncologists are already applying personalized medicine to a variety of cancers, uh, depending on what biomarkers you have, you may or may not get a particular therapy. There are various rare forms of cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative diseases, and other disorders for which the diagnosis and prediction of future illness is being guided by precision medicine approaches. So what are some of the other applications of personalized or precision medicine? Um, the ones that I think about as a geneticist is ultimately being able to design drug trials that are guided by genetic information, um, being able, for example, to identify one's sensitivity to particular medications and there's a very extreme example that uh, any physician in the crowd probably learned in medical school, a condition called malignant hyperthermia, which is a severe and sometimes lethal reaction to general anesthesia. So if you have ways to predict in advance who would be susceptible, you would want to apply that. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes today first talking about precision medicine for, for neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, and this is a very complicated area, in part because the uh, genetic underpinnings of most of these disorders is very complex and is rapidly, but is still uh, only understood at an elementary level. The tissue impacted by neuropsychiatric disease, specifically the brain, is not very accessible for doing direct laboratory assays, we can do imaging, but if you want to get a hunk of tissue out of the brain, not too many people would like to have a needle stuck through their skull and get a biopsy. Um, for many disorders, including ones that I'll talk about tonight, the diagnosis is often imprecise and sometimes completely wrong, and which can have tremendous implications for uh, prognostic, uh, for prognosis and treatment. For many of these disorders, the currently available drugs have uh, limited ability to uh, uh, be successful, and they often cause uh, side effects. So in short, we need a better way to help doctors, patients, and caregivers. So the uh, first example I'm going to talk about, and I'm talking about very recent examples from research in, in my group. Um, is looking at the genetic basis for nicotine withdrawal. So as uh, many of you can probably have guessed, and there have been studies that have shown that more than 95% of uh, people who try to quit smoking fail within the first year. And if you look at uh, what are the major factors that are responsible, it's the symptoms of nicotine withdrawal that predict whether or not a person is going to relapse. So it's been argued that it's, it's the severity of the nicotine withdrawal symptoms rather than what you might think the number of cigarette smokes or the uh, severity of nicotine dependence. Um, it's actually the withdrawal symptoms that predicts the outcome of smoking cessation attempts. So if we could understand the genetic basis of nicotine withdrawal, it could help us improve uh, smoking cessation programs and treatment and ultimately, from a public health point of view, reduce the uh, harm of smoking in our society. So I'm gonna share with you uh, results, and I'll try to 
uh, as much as I can, make sure everything is clear. What we did is in a very large sample of over 8,000 uh, subjects who were both of European uh, ancestry and African American, including both current and former smokers, we performed a genome-wide scan, which is basically an agnostic, hypothesis-free approach to look at the entire genome in a single experiment. And we tested in one experiment associations with more than five million genetic variants, and the outcome that we're measuring is the ability to quit smoking. And when we searched the entire genome, we found only one region that showed significant association, and I have it depicted on this slide. And it's a very small area on human chromosome number five, and it's including a large number of genes from a single family called protocadherin. And each of these dots represents the statistical test result for an individual genetic marker. So there are five million, so you're looking at a very tiny segment. And just for your reference, anything that's above this dotted line is what we call significant after adjusting for all the different tests that we've done. So at a, 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 P, a statistical p-value of 0 0.7 more zeros, uh, 5. And I want to point out that this association that we identified was evident. We could see it in both uh, populations, African Americans and uh, 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 Caucasians. And uh, I won't go into many details, but it's a very interesting gene that we stumbled upon. They're part of a family uh, that are called cell adhesion proteins, and they have a strong role in neurons sending their signals from one to the next. So when you think about a s something, you know, a psychiatric-related phenomenon or a physiological a brain-related phenomenon, it certainly is a, a, a good candidate to follow. And we took it one step further, and I want to point out that this work I'm presenting was done with my colleagues at Yale University. We took the top genetic marker, and we conducted in a small sample of subjects, several hundred, um, a, a challenge. We uh, injected them uh, intravenously with nicotine and then looked at their outcome and their ability or what was their urge to smoke. And we basically looked at the people who have the different forms of this marker. So here there are the three different ones, GG, AG, AA. And before the infusion, there was no difference in the uh, urge to smoke. So this uh, BQSU is a brief questionnaire on smoking urges. But after the uh, infusion test, and we measured based on this questionnaire, their urge to smoke, the, uh, there was one group in particular which had a much lower affinity or much lower desire to go after another cigarette after they have had a nicotine uh, challenge. Another example I want to point out, um, even more recent, and I think it's of, uh, uh, of, of critical importance, certainly here in eastern Massachusetts, but nationwide, the uh, opioid epidemic. We ask the question, do genes influence one's response to medications that you would take to treat opioid dependence. So one of the most commonly used medications called methadone, um, its mode of action to prevent a relapse of uh, continuing to use opiates or heroin is by activating a particular receptor in the brain called the mu opioid receptor. And the goal would be if you could determine which individuals should get methadone, and if so, at what level dose are they most likely to be successful? Obviously, you want to give the smallest dose possible. So if we could predict that, what that dose would be, uh, we would be able to do that. So we tested genetic variants. 
uh, across the genome. We had the data. And uh, very briefly, we identified, again, one particular gene. Uh, and it happened to be the mu opioid receptor gene. Want to point out that this association was only in African Americans, not in European Americans. And just to indicate, you can see the dose response, the amount of methadone needed to treat. However, we wanted to try to replicate it. We didn't have a sample. It's hard to find methadone-treated samples with opioid dependence. So we turned to some colleagues at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who had an African-American sample. That's relevant because that's where we found the association. And these were pediatric patients who were recovering from tonsillectomies or adenoidectomies. And the important point is, is that they were treated with morphine uh, to manage their pain. And uh, simply put, we were able to show in this situation the same effect, that methadone treating opioid or uh, morphine treating pain, the, a similar response, again, in African Americans. However, before we run out and start putting this into the clinic and having doctors start doing this, we need to have some appropriate clinical trials um, that are guided by the genetics so we can actually provide guidelines. And we're not there yet, but now we have the uh, paradigm for doing it. So finally, I'm just going to say a few words about Alzheimer's disease. It's, it's, as, as you know, it's a very complicated disorder. And for precision medicine, where would we begin? Where, how, where, how could we start? Well, the step one, and as you heard from uh, Katya Ravid, start with forming an interdisciplinary team. And that we have done. So our arc is in precision medicine for Alzheimer's disease. And uh, my colleagues, Rhoda O oh and Alice cronin Golem are here with me this evening. The second thing is the, quite frankly, the tougher nut. In order to do this kind of research, you need to have the study population, and that study population needs to have all the kinds of data that you would want. And if we were to start from scratch trying to do that, um, it would be a very difficult and challenging task. Uh, NIH doesn't have enough money to fund something like this. And even if the money were available, it would take many years to get there. However, we have a solution. And that solution is we at Boston University, we are the headquarters of the Framingham Heart Study. How many of you, by show of hands, have heard of the Framingham Study? OK. That's, so I don't need to say a whole lot about it. But um, so let me ask you a question to see how well you know what Framingham has meant to human health. How many of you? go to the doctor's office and have your blood pressure taken. The reason you do that is about 40 years ago, 40 to 50 years ago, Framingham investigators showed a relationship between blood pressure and heart attack and uh, risk of stroke. How many of you sometimes have your cholesterol measured? Same thing, Framingham investigators showed that lipid levels are associated with various forms of cardiovascular disease and other disorders. So here in Framingham, um, which started as a study of cardiovascular disease, actually the 70th year anniversary of the start of the study is next year. So this is how long the study has been going. It's now studying its third generation of subjects. Um, the survivors now are in, you know, over 100 years old, thereabout. And there's also a cohort of African Americans from Framingham that was more recently involved. Quickly, I just want to point out that all of these disease areas are being studied in Framingham, and these subjects are evaluated every couple years. So we have longitudinal follow up data. And importantly, in the last few years, there has been a tremendous amount of what I call omic data, genomic, transcriptomic, methylomic, metabolomic, 
These are data that have now been generated on a large portion of Framingham subjects for whom we have lots of clinical data. We even have Medicare data for many of these. So what we are trying to do is to probe all of these data to identify new drug targets and biomarkers for Alzheimer's. That's what our arc in precision medicine is. But we started with this hypothesis. Alzheimer's disease is actually not one disease. It's many diseases. How do we know that? For several reasons. One, the, the data are emerging that there are many different pathways that you would never have put together to get to Alzheimer's disease. Immune pathway, cholesterol pathway, other neurodegenerative neuronal signaling pathways. And the other reason is very simple. How many drugs that have been developed for Alzheimer's disease have worked? Case closed. It's because you're trying to shoehorn one drug into everyone. So our plan is, I could say simple, but it's not. It's to use system biology and computational methods to go through the millions, and I, I'm, I'm guessing when you include all the omic data, billions of data points, and to look at all of the subjects in the Framingham study and see if we can extract uh, what, what I call profiles that are characteristics measured on all of these lifestyle, clinical, cognitive brain imaging, et cetera. And why do we want to do that? Because there are some really positive uh, outcomes that we're hoping for. One is this new approach to clinical trials that I alluded to, that we focus the clinical trials by testing subjects, in this case of a particular subtype, for whom the drug, based on its mode of action, we think will work best in them. And the second, of course, is through this approach, we help to identify a variety of biomarkers for predicting well in advance who is at high risk for developing Alzheimer's, and of course, for treating a wider array of drugs. Um, like to talk a lot more, and maybe in the questions and answers, uh, I'll be happy to take. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I'd like to turn over the program now to Dr. O. Oh, it's yeah, just press. That's it's all set. So I'm just while they're getting me teed up here. Um, I uh, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context. Uh, so I have been working at the Framingham Heart Study, which Lindsay has now mentioned, uh, for 27 years. And I'm a neuropsychologist. And um, it turns out that even though Framingham started out as a study of heart disease and stroke, you know, everything that I do is actually related to the brain. And we've, what we've learned is what's bad for the heart is bad for the brain. Okay. And what I want to do is sort of take the next step. Lindsay has focused a lot about talking about the, um, the uh, opportunities of precision medicine. But what I'd like to point out is I want us to think about what, is, what does precision medicine do? Well, precision medicine, let's see if I can get this to work. It's the green button, right? There we go. So when we think about precision medicine, we think about clinical symptoms, okay, of the disease. We think about diagnostic testing, and then we think about, of course, treatment. What I like to do now is to push your thinking a little bit further. And I want you to think about the concept of precision health. Sometimes, actually, these two concepts are, are used interchangeably, and they're not the same thing. And that's what I wanted really to get across to you, is this idea of what precision health really means. So just to start out, one of the things I always like to point out, you know, when you're sort of dealing with Alzheimer's disease, uh, diseases uh, that are usually associated with older individuals, we talk about aging. And we think about aging as something that happens when you're older, when you're in the upper decades. In fact, aging is really a conception to death process. Okay, we're all aging. We, we age from the moment of conception. And what I want you to think about in terms of the diseases is that it turns out 86% of the diseases in this country are chronic diseases. And why is that important to think about? Chronic diseases, by definition, are insidious in onset. So that means, 
for instance, with Alzheimer's disease, if you get a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease today, it's not like you were fine the day before, the week before, the year before, or even five years before, okay? So this is something that's happening gradually over time. And that's a really important point to think about when we're thinking about what's possible in pre precision medicine. So if you're talking about a process that happens over a long period of time, in fact, what we should be thinking about is rather than focus on the disease, we should think about focusing on the health because most people start out healthy and then you progress to disease. And so if we start to think about instead of symptoms and treatment, and we think about let's optimize a person's health along, along their entire lifespan. If we optimize your health across the, the entire lifespan, we may actually be able to prevent disease altogether. So up until this point, and this is where a lot of, there's a lot of focus, is on this issue of cognitive impairment. So I'm a neuropsychologist, so I'm really interested in cognition. I'm really interested in how you think. And, uh, but what I would like to really focus in on and where I think the transformative opportunities are, are actually in the issue, is in the realm of cognitive health. So this uh, uh, um, is a theoretical model that was published by Cliff Jack. Everybody in the field actually always cites this model. So, uh, and this really is supposed to show you the progression of Alzheimer's disease as you go from normal to, d to the actual clinical diagnosis. And what I like to point out is that the purple line, that's where they think cognition becomes relevant. So I'm a neuropsychologist, and I'm not particularly pleased with the fact that no one cares about cognition until you're almost at disease. But I actually think we don't have to, I think that this theoretical model actually um, is not correct. I think that it's actually possible to detect cognitive changes much earlier on. And if we are able to detect these cognitive changes much earlier on, there are a couple uh, potential impacts. So the one that we focus on most in research is we think about if you can delay, and we, we've seen this in research, if you delay onset of symptoms of the disease by five years, you actually cut a person's risk for the disease by 50%. But I think we can do better. I think that if we detect the, the cognitive symptoms earlier, I actually think we can prevent the disease altogether. And so that's really what we've been focused on um, more recently, is how do we take these concepts of cognitive health and how do we move them into reality? How do we actually make this happen? So this is really about thinking about how do we move from focusing on precision medicine and moving into precision health. And this is actually the model in which that we are working with. And so um, this is collecting inf data in the clinic, but then pushing it out, and pushing it out so that we can start monitoring people in their natural environments, in their homes as they move about. So we have mobile and wearable technologies and now, we have smartphone, uh, smart home devices. So for me, I've been thinking a lot about how does technology enable this concept of precision health? And this is sort of what we're working with. So to start out with, we start out with this concept of we have the way we've always done things, so this traditional data collection, which means that you come into the clinic and we measure all sorts of health metrics, some of which Lindsay has already talked about. And we've been doing it this at Framingham, again, for about 70 years. We've been collecting a lot of clinical data. But now, if we wanna try to move to this precision health concept, what we need to do is we need to think about how we're gathering that data. And it turns out, through digital technology, we can actually capture this information in much greater granularity than we have before. So for instance, we have up here the whiting scale. So you know, usually you go to the doctors, you get on the scale, you find out how much you weigh. Well actually, now we have uh, these digital scales that can separate. It can separate how much is actually bone weight, how much is water weight, right? And so then we can get a much more different sense of what you're, what's, 
um, what's actually adding up to your total weight. And so we can do this across the entire clinic. Now, if we do that within the clinic, then what that allows us to do is then think about how do we then start to study those same kinds of health metrics outside of the clinic. Why is it really important to study this outside of the clinic? So I want you to think about when you go into the clinic and you have your blood pressure weight uh, measured, you have your weight measured, et cetera, you know, what's happening is we're measuring it in one point in time. And think about, let's just take blood pressure for instance. Think about all the things we think we know about blood pressure. And we're, we are drawing a lot of conclusions on the base of essentially one measurement that was taken at one point in time, often a year, two years, four years later, right? Certainly what we do at Framingham. We've been measuring people's blood pressures for the last 70 years, but we do it every two to four years. But here's the thing. We know blood pressure fluctuates. In fact, we know that it fluctuates during the day. But we don't actually know how much it fluctuates. So one of the things we have seen in the literature is, is that this belief that having high blood pressure puts you at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. But if you actually look at the data and if you actually look at all across all the different studies, the results aren't consistent. In fact, there are studies that say having high blood pressure is even protective for Alzheimer's disease. So, so, so how do we, how do we you know, resolve the fact that we have these competing results? Well, we have to go back to the presumption of what we were looking at in the first place. And I wonder all the time is with blood pressure, something as simple as blood pressure, the fact that we don't study your blood pressure over a continuous time as you're going about in your normal environment, there might be people who have different patterns of blood fracture fluctuation. And maybe that's why we see these differences in terms of their impact downstream. But we don't have that information. Now with technology, we have the opportunity to measure it. So to start with, we can talk about, there's a lot of health devices out there right now that can measure different kinds of health metrics, including blood pressure on a continuous basis. We happen to be looking at a number of different things. I like to focus on physical activity, diet, sleep, and environment as sort of the baseline. And why? Because everybody eats, sleep, and moves through their environment. And we certainly know that that all affects our health, any health, brain health, physical health, et cetera. But one of the things I like to point out is even though these health technologies now allow us to move into a person's natural environment and start to, to uh, measure it, I think, on a much more continuous and probably realistic basis, most of the health technologies out there right now require what I call high engagement. It means you have to do something with it. You have to open it up, you have to interact with it, you have to upload it, you have to download it, um, you have to be reminded to use it, etc. We know that most people, when they have, uh, you know, when they use wearable devices, like the Fitbit, for instance, the average person, what, uses the Fitbit for about two to three months and then they abandon it. So the, high, so the technologies right now, the health technologies that work, are the ones that focus on the patient. Okay, if you think about who, who uses these technologies on a regular basis, it's people who have Parkinson's disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetics. Why? Because they're patients. And the value proposition is that they want to engage with that technology because they're trying to monitor their symptoms. So everything that we're doing right now in the health device standpoint is really still focused on the concept of patient and medicine. And it's actually not focused on the concept of health. So this is sort of what we do today, which is we take sort of, we gather all this health data, and then we use big data analytics, you know, data science, in order to make, uh, in order to understand what that means. But this is where I think we have to go. I think we have to go to the point, if we want to get to precision health, we have to get to the point we have low to no engagement uh, technology. And what that means is in order to sustain monitoring on a regular basis, we're gonna have to get to the point where we're gathering that information passively. 
So one of the examples I'd like to do is, is give CryptoWire. It's a very interesting sort of company. They actually are focused on um, security. Uh, their security software for mobile applications. And they have actually created a mobile application that uses all the sensors in the phone. There's at least 10 sensors per phone. And they gather the data passively and only use 5% of the battery. And if we're able to gather data on a passive basis, that's how we're going to be able to do it on a sustainable basis. So this is where, this is sort of a look into our future. This is sort of the work that I'm sort of moving forward at this point. And I really call it about futurizing Framingham for brain health. So brain, Framingham, as Lindsay has mentioned, really revolutionized um, our understanding of heart disease. In fact, the whole concept of risk factors was coined by Framingham, and it opened up this whole field of preventive medicine. What I think about is how Framingham is now poised uh, to do the same thing for the heart as it ha uh, for the brain as it has for the heart. And so, for me, this is about fra uh, futurizing Framingham for brain health. And this is really my big vision of where I think we're headed. I actually think with the use of technology, what we can do is start to build a smart brain health ecosystem, where as we move around in our natural environments using gauging, talking, moving, I think that we'll be able to sort of uh, monitor our brain health. And why do I think that? Because at the end of the day, what we have to remember is everything we do, we do through our brain. So there actually should be no reason that we go in and do these, um, what I consider more uh, crude measures of cognition in one point in time. I think everything that we do as we move around, we're reflecting our cognitive capabilities. And if we can monitor on that continuous basis, there'll be lots of fluctuations, but we'll be able to actually pick up when you start to have that first real negative trajectory of change. And we can pick that up well within normal. And if we pick it up well with the normal, we can intervene. And that's how we prevent disease altogether. So, um, so uh, thank you very much. And what I'd like to do is invite my colleagues up here so that we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Hey, I can't actually see any of you. <laughs> because of the lights. Ooh. Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, can people hear me? All right, there we go. Um, I'm Alice Cronin Galam. You haven't had a chance to hear from me yet. I've been sitting quietly at the front listening to my brilliant colleagues from the Medical Center. Um, I'm on the Charles River campus of Boston University, where we have some different departments besides medicine. And I'm in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. That used to be called psychology. Um, the fact that we've changed our name over the last several years uh, really reflects changes in, in the field of psychology, really going toward brain sciences, neuroscience. Uh, so we have a lot of overlap with people at the medical school and in other uh, areas of the campus. So my job as discussion moderator tonight was to take some of the threads of what Lindsay and Rhoda have brought up and start a conversation going. Uh, we will talk among ourselves as if you're just eavesdropping on us. Um, and then I promise I will open it up for questions from all of you because I'm sure you're dying to ask uh, questions of these two at least. So a couple of things that occurred to me uh, have converged on the first topic I would like to bring up. And uh, it, Rhoda mentioned the fluctuations that we have over time, that uh, any time you test us is maybe not representative of what your normal state might be. You can imagine you go to the doctor, maybe you, you had to take uh, public transportation to get there, you were running late, or you know the traffic was bad. You get in, you can't find the office, right? You don't know where you're going. You get there and then they measure your blood pressure. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and you're telling your doctor, yeah, it's a little high, but you know, I just went through all of this. And, and, and please don't assume that this is how I usually am. Right? So I think we've all had that kind of experience. So there, there's certainly going to be fluctuations, and we want to understand what that's about. But be, so there are a couple ways that, that we can pull that out, right? So part of the fluctuation may be because of our genes 
right? There may be something about the genetic variants across different people that cause some of us to be kind of more stable, right? And, and some of us to fluctuate much more. Um, the other part of it is the environment. In, in the example that I just gave you, that something happened to you in your environment, and, and of course that's something that psychologists are very interested in. And, and so I thought we might start thinking along those lines for a little while. Where, where are the fluctuations coming from? Are they coming from genes? Are they coming from the environment? Are they coming from some interaction between the two? And then Dr. Albright mentioned the term epigenetics, and I don't know how many of you know that field, but that is exactly what we're talking about here. That is, you have a genetic predisposition to a condition, let's say, um, and let's say two people have that genetic predisposition, but then only one of them goes on to exhibit the symptoms. Why is that? What can we do to be the one who doesn't show the symptoms, right? So there, there might be some environmental trigger, right? And the environmental trigger could be a social kind of trigger, like stress, right? Like chronic stress in your environment, or it could be something else. It could be something about your diet or exercise or whatever. So I thought that might be a very general topic that we can start chatting about. Does that sound fair? Sure. Why not? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So I've, I've at least started it in saying, here are these things that might contribute. What might we do? Well, I guess uh, I, I can paraphrase it this way. Uh, if I uh, bastardize the uh, concept of a famous philosopher from the 16th century, John Locke, who said no man is an island, my updated view is no gene is an island. And uh, as uh, Alice pointed out, genes don't operate in a vacuum. Um, they are a, what I call a blueprint for many characteristics, both physical or psychological or other traits that you can measure. And also, genes interact with one another. One, one gene can regulate another. So what we are learning now in genetics, yes, we can find all of these mutations. And in fact, in Alzheimer's disease, for example, we've done these genome scans um, with uh, in now up to 75 or 100,000 subjects, but we estimate that we still understand less than half of the genetic mm -hmm. architecture. Mm -hmm. And part of it is, is that what we haven't been doing is A, looking at how all of these things fit into a system, and the other point is that we need to be able to think about that you have these fluctuations, and what you measure today is not gonna be the same. So you can measure a gene today, but if it's regulated by other genes or other environmental mm -hmm. factors, until you understand the nature of that regulation system, having the gene doesn't really tell you much of everything, it's only part of the story. So I think um, from what we are attempting to do in our program is to look at the big picture. And, you know, and, and I guess that's what we call systems biology. Mm -hmm. so, so a word that comes to mind for me is uh, we need to think about the concept of integration. Because mm -hmm. I think for a long time, um, our approach uh, to trying to identify whether it's genetic or these other kinds of factors, risk factors. In my case, I'm very interested in some of the modifiable risk factors mm -hmm. around things like uh, you know, sleep, diet, smoking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we tend to do is we look everything in a silo. Mm -hmm. And I think that that, uh, and as I think Lindsay says, n there is no island. Mm -hmm. Nothing operates mm -hmm. in its own. And so I'll give you one example of what I mean by integration. Right now, we believe that, I think pretty much everybody believes, that uh, physical activity and sleep affect health. Mm -hmm. They certainly expect, uh, affect brain health. And when we, but when we study it, we study physical activity and its effects on the brain, mm -hmm. and we study sleep and its effects on the brain. Mm -hmm. In fact, they interact. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So one of the things I think about in, in terms of trying to monitor physical activity and sleep is why don't we integrate it? Why don't we create 24-hour physical activity index that bring it together? But that's not enough because if we have physical activity and sleep, then we have diet. Mm -hmm. And certainly our diet affects both and then they affect each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the, one of the things that we also need to understand is the complexity of all this and how I think in the past our, our, our focus on isolating has actually not been as fruitful, mm -hmm. I think, as our opportunities now to integrate. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is um, a difficult issue. Maybe for a lot of people in the audience, you might feel this, that uh, when we say everything is important, and we say diet is important, exercise is important, sleep is important, everything's important, and you might be thinking to yourself, do I have to monitor all of this? You know, this is going to take all my time, just, just always being on track for this. We're, we're hoping that we can develop broader systems that will do some of that work for you. But I, th I think it's a really good point that Rhoda made earlier that what's good for your heart is good for your brain. You know, all these systems are working together. So if, yes, you have to figure out the best way of living that way, but when you do it, it's going to affect all the systems. So you only have to learn one set of good things to do, right? You, you know, if you do exercise, you don't have to do different exercise for your heart and your brain, right? You just yeah. do your exercise. Yes, you have to. Um, <laughs> well, right. Well, although when I think about precision health, right, because we're t really talking about personalized, and when I think about things like um, physical activity, sleep, you know, diet, for instance, realistically, if you've been a couch potato, y you can't tell a couch potato that you now have to go out there and run mm -hmm. two miles, mm -hmm. you know, three times a week. It's actually not going to happen. So, 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 I, so I think when I think about personalized health, I think about how do we integrate all the different pieces that affect health and come up with the personalized solution that's specific to that person. Yeah. Well, right. it, it, to take that analogy a step further, if you've got 10 couch potatoes, so to speak, in terms of the way they approach their health, and you were, if you were able to use other means based on genetic tests or any other tests, mm -hmm. biomarkers, and you can identify which of those folks are more likely to develop a heart attack than the others, given that they all have the same level mm -hmm. of couch potato <laughs> um, <laughs> if you were told that you have this liability yeah. that you've got already two or three strikes against you compared to your couch potato brother who may only have one. So people's response on how they, perceive, how they pursue this is going to be different. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the other point is, is when you were mentioning, Alice, you know, you read all the time in the newspaper, and I know in my family we do this all the time. I read and I find, oh, I shouldn't be eating this. It's going <laughs> to increase my risk of... Uh, cardiovascular disease, or, or even in the field I work, in Alzheimer's disease. But wait a minute, that was good for you yesterday. Right. And I think this is the confounding that we have, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that it depends on what the rest of you, what the mm -hmm. rest of your profile looks like. Maybe coffee for some people really is uh, good in terms of their risk, but maybe for others it's bad. Yeah. So until, as Rhoda said, until you can integrate all the information and look at things not in their silos, you know, then these studies that are always conflicting, maybe they'll mm -hmm. begin to make sense. Yeah. I think that is a great place for us to now open it up for, to questions from all of you. I think we've brought up a, a, several different topics, and now let's hear what you have to say. Ooh, that's good. So oh, if you have a question, <laughs> please raise your hand. Um, and we will bring a microphone around to you. So we have our first question right back here. All right, well, thank you for the very fascinating discussion and, and lectures. Um, as an undergraduate, I was able to do a little bit of breast cancer genomic research, which uh, we tried to look at the 
um, genomic pr uh, profiles and assign different chemotherapeutic uh, treatments that would be more effective. Um, and one of the things that was always difficult for me was um, we could find certain genes that may or may not have any known association with breast cancer and uh, biological plausibility. Um, when it comes to that sort of thing, uh, how much do you think someone should look for uh, and investigate the biological uh, plausibility of a, a genomic factor um, before trying to apply it in the clinic, or do you think it'd be uh, effective to, to uh, try to apply clinical treatments without uh, learning too much about the biological uh, mechanism? Huh. Well, I think yeah. in, in most circumstances, if you're developing, say, a drug based on that target, and if you don't know what the mechanism of action of that target is, how, you know, the drug development piece of it is probably going to fail, which is in part, I, I think if we were to summarize where the Alzheimer drug development field has been, the reason it has failed is because people are locked into testing what they already know. And one of the things that has, what attracted me to the field of genetics to begin with is we have an opportunity to get outside ourselves and to be able in an agnostic or what we call a hypothesis-free way to look for associations that when you find them, 90% of them, <laughs> we haven't a clue. And it isn't until we start generating other data, um, whether it's other omic data or apply other systems biology approach and begin to put things together. But to answer your question, yeah, from a, a, a prediction point of view, if you observe something and, and, and there's a correlation, um, that's one thing. But then going to any uh, therapeutic, I would be very careful. Of course, there's a long history of use of certain medications without at all knowing the biological mechanisms. Or I'm thinking especially of those psychiatric drugs. Yeah. So lithium and, and various of the other ones that uh, we had no idea how they worked. We still don't know to a certain extent. But, uh, you know, in certain circumstances sure. when you are desperate and something seems to work on somebody, then they start being used in the absence uh, of an alternative. So there are some circumstances where you don't know the mechanism and you're still using the medications. Next question to your left in the back. Uh, first, let me say that I think I echo the uh, thoughts of people in the audience that I thoroughly enjoyed the concepts presented by these extraordinary folks. Uh, having said that, there's one thing I did not hear and I precisely did not hear a precise definition of precision medicine. Uh, case, case in point, uh, just this week, I think as we speak is ongoing, the uh, first human adult trial of gene editing on a 44-year-old man with Hunter's disease. Uh, what they're going in is they're, uh, and I say this very off the cuff, snipping out the bad genes and splicing in the good ones that to me is precision medicine. You're taking this individual and all of his ancillaries and treating his individual problem with a protocol that probably wouldn't work on anyone else. All right, that to me is precision medicine. I think, I think the technique is called CRISPR. So my question, finally, is um, do you think CRISPR should be the, under the umbrella of precision medicine? And further, do you think uh, CRISPR wow. will be the gold standard? of precision medicine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab. Take a <laughs> I'll take another stab at that. So absolutely. Uh, but I point out in contrast the example you gave of uh, it, it, a, a leukodystrophy. It's a rare disorder, single gene defect. Mm -hmm. We understand the pathway very well. So even though there is some variability among uh, patients, and these are usually young children with the disorder, and it's lethal. Um, if, if you could devise a technology like uh, gene editing using CRISPR to do it, that's great. It, it, that actually is not the first example. Um, there have been other examples, uh, I know, because I work in the eye field in uh, macular degeneration, 
using uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells were able to identify a pathway that if you change the, you edit the gene and then you give the treatment, um, it actually, they applied it to two patients and it had modest effect, but there's already this happening. I think what, when we are talking about precision medicine, it's basically how can we use the tools based on knowing everything there is that we can get from you based on knowledge that we accumulated from studying a very large group of people, is there a tailored treatment? And it could be a drug. It could be that there's not a drug and you want to do something as radical as gene editing. Um, so I think that's all under the umbrella. CRISPR is one approach that I believe ultimately will have a very important place mm -hmm. on how we treat mm -hmm. disease. Uh, but it's by far not the only. Great. Our next question is right here in the center. Uh, good evening. Um, my question is actually coming from the information coming from NIH and the cohort study that they were um, uh, working on. And, and honestly, I, I've, I've heard the YouTube uh, <laughs> discussion two years ago of getting the whole thing going with Obama and, and the money and so forth. Where is that now? And it seems your discussion really plays into the group funding, the laboratories of funding from all over the world to be able to actually be able to start pulling together the data sources that you'll need. Yeah. Well, it, it's already happening. There's uh, coming, it actually comes out of the NIH director's office, Francis Collins, who, by the way, is a geneticist and former head of the National Human Genome Research Institute. So there was a big set aside of money starting a couple years ago, and they're uh, doing a couple of things. One is they're assembling the cohort, and I think you know they're talking 500,000 to a million people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're gathering the data. First, they're gathering the genetic data. That's happening now. And the second is, is there's a whole bunch of uh, these program announcements to scientists to say, okay, if you have these data, what experiments are you gonna do to further the field? So that, it, it's ongoing, it just doesn't happen overnight. The first funding, so you saw my slide out of the Boston Globe from early 2015, the funding started coming through at the end of that year and in, 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 in mass in 2016. Mm -hmm. So it's happening. It, so, but some of the challenges, because you're talking about the all of us, Right, cohort, and um, and so I actually happen to be one of the reviewers uh, for those <laughs> those applications that came in for the, all of us. And what was interesting is they took a very different approach. Um, they really looked for so a lot of the applications actually came from uh, non-academic institutions. I think the one that selected it w is an academic institution, but they brought in actually a lot of um, private industry, which was very different. It was a very different approach. Um, in terms of how they want to tackle this. But one of the things that when I was reviewing this is I did sort of push this concept with them is are you trying to focus on precision medicine or are you trying to focus on precision health? And they said actually we want to do both. And I'm like, well, you can't actually do both because they actually <laughs> involve different kinds. It's a, it's, a, it's a different question. And so, uh, um, so one of the areas that they're, they're now trying to figure out is actually how do you do this longitudinal, large-scale monitoring of health over a long period of time? One of the things I get asked all the time is, I, everywhere, everywhere I go, I want to do a Framingham-like study of blah, blah, blah. It doesn't really matter. And, um, and, then they, and they're always coming to me saying, so how do I do a Framingham? I, we want to do what Framingham does, right? We, you've been doing this for so long. We want to do what you're doing. And what I say is, actually, you don't want to do what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Framingham started in 1948. <laughs> the last thing you want to do right now is replicate Framingham. What you want to do is you want to re replicate the concept of Framingham. You want to figure out how are we going to monitor a group of people over long periods of time. And that's what I was trying to present. I was trying to present how do you actually get to a Framingham-like study 
without ever bringing someone in, right? Mm -hmm. They're still trying to solve that, just to let you know. And, and actually to follow up, <laughs> one of the real challenges in this notion of precision medicine versus precision health, so precision medicine obviously is disease focused. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. you have to have a large cohort of people, including many with the disease. Mm -hmm. And Framingham and other epidemiological are, uh, studies are community-based. They enroll people because of the catchment area they're in, not because of what diseases they have. Mm -hmm. And then you follow them over time. And it's, it's only when you follow people a long time do you build up enough incident cases of disease. So those kinds of studies for following particular kinds of diseases uh, are not the optimal way to go. Mm -hmm. You want to build a cohort that is somehow related more strongly and enriched for whatever health issue or disease issue that you want to tackle. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about the uh, genomics in all of this? Is, is that layered in? Is that implied in, in all of this? Uh, or is that honestly yeah. just sort of superficial? No, and now it's embedded yeah. it, in all of these studies. Yeah, hi. Um, I would like to know how, like personally, how optimistic you are about this. Like uh, how, how realistic do you, do you think is especially the precision health approach? Because of exactly the uh, the thing that you that you mentioned, that it's going to be really really tough to have this passive um, collection of data, a huge amount of data that you will need. Uh, also because of people maybe not wanting to share something when they're not feeling sick, uh, privacy issues, and I don't know what. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems to me like a, a huge task, uh, and maybe with big data and AI, I don't know what you're thinking about. So that would be nice to know. Um, but like, so, so for me, the question is, we were talking a little bit about this precision health and about the disease approach, but um, what do you also think about people just regularly coming in to clean up um, like things that, that accumulate uh, as we age, as you said, um, and uh, like having them come in again and again and again, like every few years, um, if you, and then obviously applying the things that you know about precision medicine, like, you know, this this particular person uh, maybe needs a different kind of cleanup and so on. Like, mm -hmm. what is, what is, what are your ideas about that and especially how optimistic are you about this, like, very, it seems to me, very broad precision mm -hmm. health? Uh, there, there's so. a lot going on in, in your question. <laughs> um, and so it, one interpretation that, that I have, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, is that if if you think that there's a lot about the privacy issues and people don't want the passive data collection because they're healthy and they don't think anybody has any business collecting their data, maybe, and instead they would rather go in and be cleaned out once in a while, is, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, that, that that's a, a part of it. So, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I think it, it depends on, on the security of it, right? To begin with, I'm sure, Rhoda, you've had a lot of ideas about this. So first of all, I'm very optimistic. I'm kind of an optimistic person anyway. She is, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, and uh, I, I'm optimistic because, one, there's really a lot of smart people out there, uh, far smarter than I am, thank God. And, um, and so I think that what I see happening in the technology front is that there is much more um, um, passive technologies that are being built. I can give you one example. I, um, I also go to China a lot. There's a lot of technology being built there. I work with this company. It's called iCarbonX. Uh, we talk about sort of the need to gather this multi-omics data, particularly around the metabolomics, proteomics, which changes over time. The challenge, of course, is, is how do you collect you know, biological samples on an ongoing basis? Uh, you, you know, people can't come in all the time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of money. Um, they don't want to come in. Uh, so here's something that they've been de developing. They've been developing a smart toilet. I love the concept of that. Right? Because <laughs> think about that. That's a really natural way to collect biological samples on an ongoing basis. <laughs> All right? Uh, that's where we're headed. 
Okay. <laughs> that's, that's your takeaway lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us are you cleaning that up image. now. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Actually, I'd like to answer that question also, but from a different angle. So am I an optimist when it comes to precision medicine? Well, my answer is I like to bet on a sure thing, and this is a sure thing. Because we're already there, as I pointed out. We're, we're still in the grand scheme relatively at the beginning, but I think that if I were to project in 10 years from now, it's gonna be a lot of precision medicine is gonna be routine in primary care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have the next here in the back. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. <clears throat> so there's a, like an old Russian expression that says that there's no healthy people, they're just those that are undiagnosed. It turns out that's just <laughs> precision health. But in uh, moving, in a, when you move the diagnostic model from one of sort of black and white diagnostics to one that's more of a spectrum and focus on risk factors, it sort of stands to reason that the treatment model would change as well. And kind of wanted to ask you how you think that would look like from a population health standpoint. So, so I'll, I'll give you my sort of dream. <laughs> um, I imagine that we're collecting data passively about an individual. That person is getting, it's integrated, it's fed back to them. I think about things like how Alexa, um, Google Home, et cetera, right? How that can be the mech, that can be the user interface that feeds you back, right? And says, oh, you know what I noticed the other day you didn't, you didn't move around a lot. You ate kind of a little bit more than you used to. Seems like you didn't get enough sleep. You know, today, be good if you could eat a little healthier, maybe walk a little bit more, sort of give you that kind of feedback on a continuous basis. I think that that build in a value proposition where you are constantly getting this feedback mechanism in a way that you can consume it very easily and very naturally. I think that that's the way in which we're gonna be to in able to start intervening. Mm -hmm. And I think if we start to do that on a continuous basis, again, this is this concept, we're gonna be optimizing your health on a regular basis. That's how I think overall we're gonna reduce you know, from a public health standpoint. You know, again, 86% of the diseases in this country are chronic diseases. They are, they are preventable. 90% of strokes are preventable. We already know that. So this is sort of how we, I think we're gonna get to actually finally being able to prevent them. We have to give, you can't go in and say, oh, you know, you gotta, you gotta lose 10 pounds, to, you know, and then you leave the office and, you know, at least for me, you know, I worry about my weight right before my physical exam. <laughs> and, then, and then at that moment, I'm like, oh, God, I got to lose, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I leave, and I really don't think about it again until about a month before I have my next physical exam, <laughs> right? And so it would be really nice, though, if I had sort of, you know, something that's sort of gathering information and saying on a regular basis, be nice if you walk 10 more steps today you know, and, and feeding it to me in a way that I can consume it on a daily basis, and that's how I think we're gonna actually impact on the, on the public health side. Next question to your right. Hi. If we're on a 10-year arc for precision medicine, what do we think the timeline arc is for precision health? Hmm, that's interesting. So uh, I think it's starting to happen in tandem. Yeah. So I, I, for instance, I've, uh, I showed you sort of the model in which we're, we're actually right now trying to brain, build that brain health monitoring system. Um, I'll give you an example of where we've sort of started. Again, I'll use China. Uh, so I'm about to go there uh, at, after the Thanksgiving holiday. So uh, anybody, anybody know about WeChat? Has anybody heard about WeChat, right? That's got to be like the most ubiquitous <laughs> application that's used anywhere. Everybody in China uses WeChat. And they use WeChat for everything. 
They use it for all their social interaction, social media, they upload videos, they text each other, they call each other, they get their DD or Uber you know, from it, they pay from it, they buy on Amazon um, or I guess uh, Alibaba, et cetera. They do everything on WeChat. So what have we done? We've taken a cognitive smartphone application, it's called Savonix, uh, and um, what I like about Savonix is that it's built on a, a gaming platform, so it's getting granularity of information. We actually are working with iCarbonX. They have a WeChat platform that helps people with diabetes monitor their uh, mm -hmm. symptoms. We've embedded the, we're embedding Savonix right now in order to monitor their cognitive behaviors. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying, and we're working with Tencent, Tencent open, owns uh, WeChat, and, uh, and we're gonna aggregate. We're gonna start aggregating all this data mm -hmm. in order to see, can we actually pick up cognitive signals as people engage with WeChat? Because again, everything we do, we do through our brain. And I actually think we're gonna to get to a point where we can monitor our cognitive behaviors without ever giving any formal tests. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of our first start in doing that. So I think it's starting to happen in tandem. So if mm -hmm. we look at a timeline of you know, 10 years for precision medicine, I think precision health is right behind it. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is, I believe that it's not the medical community that's gonna solve this. I think there's a whole different community. I think there's a whole uh, industry. I think we have to build a new business ecosystem uh, right now, we're really tied into the medical model. And I think that in order to get to the precision health, we have to build a, a complementary uh, business ecosystem that's focused on precision health. I think when companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, IBM, um, as well as a number of, you know, myriad of other technology, uh, data science uh, uh, companies, when they are equal players in the healthcare space, I think we would have gotten to precision health. We're going to have our final question for the night right here in front. Hi, I'm curious about the uh, the face-off between the genetics people and Steve Hyman comes to mind. People who who, who <laughs> sort of feel like you know genetics. I mean, that's what precision medicine. It's it's genetics. Everything else is irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And and people who yeah. say you know you got to look at everything and yeah the genetics is important but it's 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 only a part. How do you see that dynamic playing out? And I'm curious for Dr. O oh, how much she feels that, that her dog is being wagged by that tail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, for me, it's all about integration, right? That's what I, I talk about. I don't think we should be picking this way or that way. I think we gotta be integrating both together. And it's, it, it is hard because we tend to do this in a very siloed way and we tend to believe in our sort of uh, approach. I think Lindsay is a little bit more broader. That's why I sit here with them. Uh, <laughs> um, in, in the sense that it's not gonna be one or the other. In fact, we're not gonna solve it that way. It's going to be the integration. I think Lindsay has been giving us examples of how that works mm -hmm. and I don't know if you wanna comment I, I, Yeah, that. I think the, the uh, paradigm you just cited is and it's an old one. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, I, I grew up in the genetics field and I, I am a firm believer that there is no human trait that doesn't have a genetic basis. That doesn't mean it's genetically determined. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I think that it's going to be through both what we do, our behaviors, because it relates to our exposures and it relates to that which impacts our genes. Mm -hmm. So. The genes are a blueprint, and you know you want to build a house. Then you got to look at all the materials that go on top of it. Mm -hmm. As we already discussed uh, epigenetics a little bit, right? So it's the environmental triggers for some of these. And if the geneticists want to pull that into their domain and say, "Well, that's genetics," well, then what isn't genetics, right? So um, I, I think we can be much broader in bringing in a lot of different disciplines that are going to help us understand that. Which is why we're a multidisciplinary. That's group. us. That's all. Yeah. We're all about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank each of you for a wonderful presentation, and how proud Boston University can be of what you've represented for them. I had one thought for Dr. O as I was thinking about it. your last comment. Seemed to be the greatest endorsement of Fitbit. <laughs> Uh, 
and Dr. Uh, Ferrer, I wonder if we can push you into the future since you have such a long distinguished career in this whole area of neurobiology and Alzheimer's. What can you predict of progress or avenues for progress in the next five to 10 years in this desperately flat area of progress of Alzheimer's? Boy, that's, a, that's one of the toughest questions that I always get, and I hate to be held to any statement I make when it comes to predicting, in, in terms of treatment, where we're going to be. If you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have certainly said, oh, we're 10, 20 years away, and that would be just to protect myself. But <laughs> now, uh, based on, in part, the basic science developments that we're now understanding that Alzheimer's is a multi-pathway, multi-system disease. Secondly, finally, as I pointed out, our um, uh, federal government has finally uh, come around to the fact mm -hmm. that, and the examples would be in heart disease, cancer, and AIDS. When money was put into research, within, it took time, but you know, with certainly within our lifetimes and even shorter, there have been tremendous strides. Mm -hmm. If this continues, if that kind of investment continues in Alzheimer's disease, we could be looking at um, some effective treatments, not necessarily a cure, again, within 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great note to end this conversation on. So please join me in thanking all of our guests tonight one last time. I also want to thank Lee and Niall Albright for their continued yes. support. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank all of you for spending your Wednesday night with us. On your way out, please sign up for our mailing list. It's the best way to keep in touch about everything happening here at the Museum of Science for Adults. Thank you. Have a great night.